Welcome, weary travellers, to the sleepy Scotsman. A sanctuary of stories, nestled amid the mist-laden hills of bonnie Scotland. In this cosy corner of the internet, we invite you to embark on a mesmerising journey into the heart and soul of our ancient land. Today, we unfurl the tartan tapestry of history as we venture into the realms of Clan Campbell, a name that resonates with power, passion and the indomitable spirit of the Highlands. Like whispers carried on the Highland breeze, their stories beckon us to unravel the secrets that lie beneath. Join us as we breathe life into the forgotten tales and fabled ancestors of Clan Campbell. Let the crackling fire warm your spirit and senses, and the charm of Scottish dialect transport you to a bygone era. Together, we shall unlock the gates to a world where legends intertwine with reality, where honour and loyalty forge the destiny of a famous clan. So sit back, relax, and let the ethereal enchantment of the sleepy Scotsman carry you away on this captivating odyssey through time and heritage. Immerse yourself in the magic, let your imagination soar, and together let us illuminate the legacy of Clan Campbell. For it is in these tales that Scotland's heart truly beats. Clan Campbell, the legend of Kilhourn. The pedigree of the Campbells can be traced back to the 13th century when the family was first mentioned in important Scottish documents. They got that name it said because of an ancestor who had a facial peculiarity. For in the Gaelic, the words cam deal mean wry mouth. Highland names were often the result of some personal defect or a tribute. Malcolm Canmore, for instance, can more means the big head. And so we got Malcolm with the big head. Campbell is the surname of the Dukes of Argyll. The first Duke was called Callan Moore, which means Big Colin. And ever since his day, the clan title for the chief has been McCallan Moore, or Son of Big Colin. The Dukes of Argyll are looked up to with the most profound reverence by their kinsmen and clansmen and are regarded by them as more important than royalty itself. When Queen Victoria's daughter, the Princess Louise, married the Marquis of Lorne, who is the eldest son of the Duke of Argyll, the Campbell clan did not consider that a special honour had been paid to the Scottish family. Not a bit of it. What they said on the day of the wedding was, Isn't it proud that the Queen will this day that her daughter has got the son of Macallan Moore for her husband? Next in rank to the Dukes of Argyll are their cousins, the Campbells of Breadalbane. An ancestor of this branch was Sir Colin Campbell, Callan du Naroya, which means Black Colin of Rome. He received, as his inheritance from his father, the lands of Glenorchy, after the MacGregors had been driven from them. And here is a story of that Sir Colin. Knight Templar and Lord of Kilhourn Castle, the ruins of which 
can still be seen on a peninsula on Loch Awe in Argyllshire. Judging from what remains of the castle and from the commanding position which it occupies, it's easy to see that it must have been, in its day, a very important stronghold. There was a great tower, five storeys high, which is said to have been planned and added to by Lady Campbell when her husband was away fighting in the Crusades. The Knights Templar were the most important and most powerful of the great military orders of the Middle Ages. The object of the order was a noble one. It was to maintain, by force of arms if necessary, a free passage for pilgrims who wanted to visit the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. Fighting in the Crusades meant long absence from home, so when Sir Colin went away to Europe and Palestine, his lady knew that there would be a period of loneliness before her, with but scanty news of her husband's doings. Accompanying Sir Colin on the expedition were men of his own clan, one of whom was sent back to Scotland at regular intervals to tell Lady Campbell and their young son how Sir Colin was getting on. During his absence, which had extended for over seven years, he was for a time in Rome, where he had a very singular and disturbing dream about his wife and his home. He tried to forget the dream, but it preyed on his mind to such an extent that he confided it and his fears to one of the monks. In those days, people believed greatly in dreams and what they foretold, and the monk at once advised Sir Colin to go home because, in his opinion, a very serious domestic calamity threatened. Acting on his advice, Sir Colin left for Scotland. After encountering many dangers and difficulties, he reached a place near Glasgow called Sakoch, which is still owned by a branch of the Campbell family. At Sakoth, there lived an old woman of his clan. This old woman, in his early days, had been a nurse. In the disguise of a beggar, he arrived at her cottage at nightfall and knocked on the door. When she opened the door, she saw what she supposed to be a poor beggar man who asked her for food and shelter. She at once asked him to come inside and sit by the fire, and she set about making some porridge for her visitor. As he stretched out his hands to the blaze of the fire, her startled eyes lighted on a peculiarly shaped scar on his arm. Oh, Callan do, Callan do, my bairn that I nursed, she cried. It is myself that knows that scar. And she wept in her joy, for she had supposed him to be dead. She hastened to tell him all that had happened in his absence and the story supplied a reason for the uneasiness caused by his dream. It appeared that for some years no word of any kind had been received in Argyllshire with regard to Sir Colin, nor had any of his letters been delivered which he had sent to his wife. Not only that, but news had been circulated that he had been killed in battle in the Holy Land. Now, Sir Colin knew that someone must have played him false, 
he had repeatedly sent home clansmen with letters and news for his wife, and it was scarcely possible that every messenger sent by him should have perished before reaching Scotland. His old nurse was able to supply the explanation and justify his suspicions. All the rumours about his death had come apparently from one source. This was a neighbouring laird, the Baron McCorkadale, who as was eventually proved had intercepted and killed or else imprisoned every one of Sir Colin's messengers. By degrees he induced Lady Campbell to believe in her husband's death, and at last he proposed marriage to her, and she, believing that he was her best friend, accepted him. This was the news that his old nurse had for Sir Colin, and further the marriage was fixed for the following day. Indignant at what he had heard, Sir Colin set out for Kilhourn early the next morning. As he followed the romantic windings of the River Orkney, the lively sounds of the bagpipe and the gay shouts of his clansmen assembled to join in the festivity were borne to his ears on the breeze. He crossed the drawbridge and entered the gates of the castle, which on this important occasion were open to all. Nobody recognised him, for he still wore his beggar's rags. He stood for a little, silently gazing on the scene of excitement and feasting, until one of the servants asked him what he wanted. To have my hunger satisfied and my thirst quenched, he said, and at once food and drink were brought to him. He ate, but he refused to drink, making the request that the lady of the castle would give him a cup with her own hands and allow him to drink to her health. Lady Campbell was told of this strange request from a beggar, and being always charitable and benevolent, she came at once and handed him a cup of wine. Sir Colin drank to her health, and as he handed back the empty cup, he dropped a ring into it. The lady, observing his action, took out the ring and examined it. To her amazement, she found it to be a ring which she had given to her husband when he departed for the Holy Land, and which he had promised to keep as a talisman on the field of battle and his most sacred possession. Greatly agitated, she said to the beggar, Speak, man! Where got ye this ring? Got ye it on the sea, or got ye it on the land, or got ye it on a dead man's hand? And Sir Colin, gazing earnestly at her, said, I neither got it on the sea, nor got I it on the land, nor yet on a dead man's hand. I got it from you on our parting day, and I give it to you on your wedding day that he let his beggar's cloak fall from him, and he stood, revealed to the astonished company in the white cloak of the Knight Templar with the scarlet cross on his breast, their own lost Sir Colin. Oh, my husband, my husband, cried Lady Campbell, full of joy, as she threw herself into his arms. A shout of delight from his clansmen rent the air. 
and the pipers made the castle resound with the pibroch of the Campbells. Baron Corkudale was allowed to depart unnoticed. In their joy at being reunited, Sir Colin and his lady were generous to the traitor and let him go unpunished. But after the death of Sir Colin, some years later, his son, Black Colin II, avenged the wrong done to his father and took from the Baron his lands and possessions. As the embers of our story fade and the echoes of Clan Campbell's legacy linger, we bid you farewell, dear dreamers. May the spirits of old guide your path and may the allure of Scotland continue to ignite the fires of your imagination. Remember to embrace the magic that surrounds us and join us on our next adventure through the captivating realm of Scottish tales. Until we meet again from the sleepy Scotsman, good night and slancher.